The books tonight, um, I sometimes find when I chair these sessions and they're two or three different authors, it's sometimes hard to pull ideas and themes together. These two, have, I think, have, have really suit each other. And right from the start, it's because they may be here under a kind of loose crime fiction thing. And there are crimes that happen in the fiction of both novels. But within both are real literary talents bursting to get out of the genre, I feel. Um, these are two of the best books in Britain in any genre this year, I think, far less the ones that are in crime fiction. Um, the format we're going to have here is uh, both, both authors will do a short reading. Um, we'll take it in turns, obviously. We will start with Simon. Now, um, Rupture, I think, is a real, uh, you know, a portrait of a very bleak society where children are so damaged and hurtful that a teacher shooting up a school is not the worst thing that happens in the book. There are bleaker things that seem to happen in that book. Um, but it also gives a fantastic view of, of the pressures on the police to, to face up to how something like that would happen. Simon now lives, he was born in Brighton and lived, uh, you think you were born there, yeah? yeah. And, now move, and has moved back there after a period working in London as a journalist. Um, and this book, as well as uh, it's one of the festival's readers' first book awards, so you can get this card and vote for it as one of the best debut novels at the festival. Um, it is up for the John Creasy New Blood Dagger at the CWA Dagger Awards on the 8th of October, as is Karen's book, which is actually up for the, the CWA Gold Dagger itself, isn't it? So uh, we have two of the top writers in the country here. That's, that's great. So um, I'd like to hand over now to Simon, who will read a little bit from Rupture. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, so as um, Alan said, the, the book is set in the aftermath of a, a school shooting. Um, um, and it, it's structured uh, so that it alternates between first person, uh, uh, essentially witness statements, and then there's a third person strand which kind of weaves the, the story together. Um, and you're following uh, Lucia May, who's the, um, the policewoman, who's charged with investigating the shooting. Um, and she's looking at uh, less at what happened and more at, the, more at why. Um, and the section I'm going to read from is, um, is in chapter two. Uh, and it's the first time we encounter Lucia. Um, and it happens to take place at the scene of the crime. <coughs> She turned to her left and moved along the passageway, down the short flight of stairs and into the entrance hall. She paused, wondering whether he had done the same. She glanced right towards the canteen and then the other way towards the doors. Through the glass she saw two uniforms and beyond them the playground and beyond that the road. The policemen were watching her, their arms folded and their eyes shaded by the brims of their helmets. There was blood on the floor. She had known it was there, and she had meant to ignore it, because the blood had come after, during, not before. She looked at it anyway. The girl whose blood it was had still been alive when she had shed it. It had run, run down her arm and to her hand, and from her fingers as the teacher had carried her out. It lay in drops, and in several places it was smeared, as if by a toe, or a heel, or a knee where someone had stumbled. He would not have stopped, Lucia was sure, and so she carried on, not walking on the blood, but not not walking on the blood. The assembly hall was some distance from the staff room. The walk would have allowed him plenty of time to think, to reconsider, to change his mind and then back again. Somehow she knew that he had not thought. He had focused on not thinking. As she paced the length of the corridor, she passed classrooms with their doors open and a series of recessed stairwells. She glanced through each doorway and up each flight of stairs, sure that he would have done the same. In her school, she recalled, there had been pupils' work displayed along the corridors, geography projects or charity work, or photos from the year-end musical. The walls she passed were bare, breeze block grey. There was tape across the doors that led into the assembly hall. The doors themselves were locked. Lucia took a key from her pocket, turned it in the padlock, and opened one of the doors. She ducked under the tape and stepped inside. It smelt of plimsolls. Rubbery, sweaty, the yield of scores of scrabbling feet. The assembly hall, she knew, doubled as the gym. 
There were climbing frames folded to the walls and locked in place. She shut the door behind her, just as he had done. He would have looked to the front, she assumed, at the stage in whomever had been speaking, the headmaster, Travis. Lucia's eyes, though, caught on the climbing frame opposite her, on the ropes that bisected the rows of bars. One of the victims had pulled themselves upright, had used a rope to try and help them escape the onrush of bodies. There was blood on the knot at the bottom, and at intervals were several feet up. At head height, the blood marks stopped. The hall was as it had been all week. There was no clear pathway to the stage, nor to the side of the hall across from her. From the rear wall to the podium, chairs lay on their backs, on their sides, any way but the right way up. Many were still laced together, so the way, where one chair had fallen, the rest had fallen too, transforming the row into a barrier, the legs of the chairs into barbs. Lucia was reminded of an image of Verdun, of the land and the barricades between the trenches. She imagined children, their eyes bleeding fear, tripping and becoming entangled, and then trampled by those behind. She imagined the impact of one of the upended chair legs against a stomach, a cheek, a temple. On the chairs and under them were jumpers, some books, the contents of children's pockets. A set of keys here, attached to a chain, attached to a belt loop, torn from someone's trousers. An iPod, black, with its headphones still plugged in and its screen cracked. She tried to ignore the state of the hall and to picture it as he would have seen it. Every seat full, the children silent for once given the circumstances of the assembly, some of them crying and trying not to. The teachers seated in rows flanking the headmaster, jaws tense, eyes downcast or fixed on the headmaster himself. Travis at the lectern, his hands on the corners furthest away from him, and his elbows locked, his eyes commanding the attention of his audience, his speechifying relentless, despite the late arrival to the hall. Travis would have seen him walk through the doors, of course. Some of the teachers would have too, though they could not have made out what he was carrying. Children in the back row may have turned, may even have noticed the gun, but they would have assumed, surely, that it was a prop that his late entrance was staged to coincide with some aspect of Travis's address. The gun was in keeping with the theme of the headmaster's sermon, after all. Violence was the theme of the day. She traced his steps as best she could, moving across the rear of the hall and then turning at the corner towards the stage. Halfway along the side wall, Lucia stopped and faced inwards, in the direction of where the pupils would have been sitting. He would have had no skill with the gun. His aim was poor and his prey would have started moving and the gun itself did not fire straight. So Sarah Kingsley, aged 11, was the first to be shot. As it turned out, she was also the last to die. Lucia wondered if it had registered his mistake after he had squeezed the trigger, whether he had even noticed. The first report, report would have impacted like a brick through glass. The stillness in the hall would have shattered and been displaced by a jagged, piercing panic. The children would have scattered, they would have screamed. He would have tried to remain still, to stand unyielding against the thrashing bodies, to find his aim again. Once more he had fired, and once more he had missed his target. Felix Arbe, aged 12, had died instead. Two from two. The weapon was a museum piece, not a semi-automatic. It was in poor condition. That he killed five, five with six bullets, was in a way a minor miracle. It was the worst kind of luck. The teachers would have been standing by now, fixated and immobile like theatre goers trapped in the circle as chaos consumes the stalls. They would have seen him fire for a third time and they would have seen the third child fall. When he fired again, his fourth bullet, the second one to hit Donovan Stanley, aged 15, they might have understood. When he had then looked at them and taken his first step towards the stage, they might finally have run themselves. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Simon, it's, it's something of a cliche to say there's two sides to every story. I think what you show is that no matter how many people you ask about an event, there'll be as many sides to the story as people that, that yeah, you ask. Yeah. And wh one of the things I really enjoyed most about the book is that there, each alternate chapter where it's it's like an, an interview, the police interview transcript, is like a, a character portrait. It's like a series of character portraits and uh -huh. monologues. And then the other chapters are the ones that are kind of the, the, the police trying to put together how something like that could have happened, which is the forward drive of the narrative. I was just wondering, yeah. how did you land upon that as the way to structure it and, and, and not just to do a straightforward A to B investigative novel? Yeah, well, I, I, I wanted to, the reader to 
to go on the same journey that um, Lucia goes on um, in her investigations. Um, it, it, she, as you say, she, every, everyone's point of view presents a different version of the truth, and, and, and Lucia trying to get to the bottom of the crime and, and why it happened, um, she has to interpret from all these different um, um, statements where the truth actually lies. Um, and I, I thought it would be intriguing or challenging for the reader to, to have to go on the same journey. Um, and it was fun to, to write from that perspective as well. Um, mm -hmm. Initially I wanted to, I thought about trying to structure the book entirely through first person um, narratives, but as you say, I think the third person strand kind of helps to, to weave it together. Because yeah. um, um, the other interesting thing is that very quickly I found my sympathy was with the killer. Yeah. But, um, there's, there's a real sense of, of bullying at work going on there, a lot of factors, the way the kids are reacting to them as well, but you, you, you start, if not sympathising, at least understanding mm. what, uh, why, why this guy has cracked. And obviously since the book's come out, that has become totally different mm. in this country because of what happened with Raoul Moat and sites on Facebook showing you know, kind of crazy sympathy for, for him. And I wondered, you know, if the book had been published six months or supposed to be published six months after it was published mm. in January, if the publishers would have kind of held back a little bit, because I even remember that the week the, the moat shootings happened, uh, there was a film in the cinemas called uh, The Killer Inside Me, yeah. which yeah. opened virtually the next day. Mm. And at the Herald newspaper, the night editor dropped the review of the film because he mm. didn't want to have something saying The Killer Inside Me mm. on the same pages as, as, as this thing. So there was this strange sensitivity. So how do, how, where you really want to build up a sense of sympathy or is sympathy going too far for the killer? No, I think, I think you can have sympathy for, um, for someone like Samuel in the book or, or Raoul Mo without necessarily condoning their actions. I, I, think, um, I think that's what Lucia struggles with in, in, in the book. Um, and I think also with, with fiction it's one, of the, it's one of the things that fiction can do so well that it's hard to do in newspapers and, and, and fiction reports, uh, non-fiction reports. Um, you can look at areas and issues that, that are very sensitive and they, they, people do sort of kind of shy away from um, that kind of harsh truth that may lie, lie behind a, um, an incident like occurs in the book. Um, so, but yeah, no, I, I, I definitely wanted the reader to feel a sense of sympathy, but, but as I say, that doesn't mean that you have to agree with what Samuel chose to do. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> the uh, it, one of the things again that is different about it is is a policewoman, and that's very key to it because of the the sexism she suffers at work, um, the fact that her bosses just kind of want the paperwork cleared up, and she, as a detective, is searching for the truth. To bring Karen in now, anybody who's read th Karen's three books will recognise that very perspective. Um, Karen, of course, has has done three novels now: Twilight Time. Uh, after the fire, and now Shadow Play, which, as I said earlier, is up for probably the key uh, crime fiction award in this country. Uh, so, mark in your diaries October the eighth, and check the paper the next day to see if these guys have both won it. Um, so, Karen, as you possibly know, was uh, a policewoman um, who worked with A Division in Glasgow, right in the centre of, of uh, the city and after I think five and a half years left to have a family and has since worked with the council and and is now I think the heir to Ian Rankin up here you know if you want somebody who can get the psychology of characters and give you a great narrative as well this is your writer so um, Karen are you going to read us a, a little piece of shadow play as well please yep um